And in his first media conference, the newly appointed boss said, I'm too sexy for my shirt. Another two countries are back playing, Estonia and Hungary, with Poland, Portugal and Denmark waiting in the wings in the next couple of weeks. Football is coming well out of lockdown. Hello again from Will Downing alongside my fellow lockdown football commentators, Stefan Jorni and Dimitro Zulai. Mark Rodden is back with us tomorrow. Later on, we're in Tallinn with Ayat Savari on the restart of the Estonian League and the perils of covering it. A deep dive from Paris with Matt Spiro on the league on halt and France's 20-year climb back to the summit of world football. There could be a book in that. And we'll hear from Rob Palmer of Sky Sports about his commentary heroes. But first, it's the United States and Ohio to join the newest boss in the MLS. FC Cincinnati inadvertently gained massive publicity in their appointment of Yap Stam as their new coach because the publicity shot they used was of the wrong man. Not Bruce Willis or Mark Strong or Mr. Muscle or anyone like that, but Ajax youth coach Tinas van Tonnenbroek. They do look reasonably similar, close but no cigar. Just before coming to air, he's been doing his introductory press conference. It's been a video press conference because of the way things currently are on Zoom. And we've grabbed a word with him. The new coach of FC Cincinnati, Yapstam. Everything was, was, was going well. You know, yesterday, uh, every, everybody knows, and, and you're aiming a little bit up of, about this picture that came out. You know, so, uh, you know, yesterday was a very uh, busy day. You know, it was a hard day. A lot of talking, a lot of meetings. Eventually, so we, we used the uh, the double ganger to do the picture for me. So eventually, uh, everybody knew and understand what we were what we were going to do. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Congratulations on your new job in Cincinnati. Um, how do you think the MLS compares strength wise with European leagues that you've played in? And of the various managers, big name coaches that you've played for, are there any traits that you feel you've inherited from them? Well. <laughs> You don't want to. I think as a head coach, you don't want to copy certain managers, and, and there's there's always um, well a very positive thing as a player playing at a very high level. You're going to be working with like very uh, big managers and, and well-known managers all over the world that won a lot of trophies as well. Uh, so you try to think about when you go into management yourself, into coaching yourself, you try to think about that these head coaches that you've been working with and how they approach certain situations, what they do, have done in certain situations, how they've been played in a certain situation. But I think it's important for myself as a head coach that you, that you stay close to yourself and what you want to achieve eventually uh, with your uh, with your squad, uh, with the roster to eventually uh, get, the, get the results. So, um, you know, I've, I've, of course, sometimes you're thinking back at certain managers like Sir Alex Ferguson or Angelotti's, uh, you know, or Van Gaal's, or whatever, but I think I've got my own idea about, uh, you know, um, managing uh, a certain team, uh, which I'm very confident in and and which I think can be very successful. Um, Comparing the MLS to certain leagues in in, in Europe, I think if you look at the ability of of players individually in the MLS and and also at the teams, the the certain teams in uh, in the MLS, I think it's a very strong league. And... um, I wouldn't say that uh, they can like straight away can compete with like uh, like Spain or maybe the Premier League, but uh, I think they're they're, they're close. And and uh, if you look at the interest of every manager and and also the players, that a lot of players want to play in the MLS. So I think it's going to be growing and growing and getting stronger and stronger every season. So that makes it very interesting. What would you consider, with it being a young club going into a new stadium, what would you consider to be success on the pitch for this season? For this season? Well, (laughs) it's always, you need to be careful in answering these questions, of course, because people stick to it when you say certain things. You know, but um, we spoke about the roster. Uh, We've we've seen the last uh, two games, you know, they were unlucky at certain times in these games as well. Um, There's a lot of ability Within the, within the roster, if you're looking at the players individually. And for myself now, it's very important to make that ideal combination of players uh, during games as well. So they, they're going to be successful. Everybody understands their role, their part in what they need to do and what I expect from them on the pitch, but also in what they feel comfortable in doing, of course, which is very important as well for the players. So, um, you know, so there, there's still a lot of games to be played and um, and we can we can still make a lot of steps. There's a lot of uh, competition within the league but um, you know I'm not going to say we're got, we need to be there 
but um, I'm sure we, get, we can we can make big steps uh, this season. A new challenge then for Yap Stam, his first venture into the United States. The full media conference is on fccincinnati.com and the club Facebook page. Stefan, you've been covering MLS for a long time. Quite a challenge for him. And now 13 of the 26 clubs of overseas bosses. Well, it's going to be a very challenging time for um, Yam Stam. He's coming with, uh, with uh, one of his assistants he had with him at the Pegs Roller and Feyenoord. Clearly, it's going to be uh, difficult for Yam Stam after two uh, difficult spell at Feyenoord and Pegs Roller. I know he did quite well at uh, Reading, but, but so far he's, he has been struggling uh, to put a stamp on the team. And the uh, general manager for Cincinnati is a Dutch guy, Gerard Nipkamp. He definitely facilitated uh, the uh, signing of Yam Stam. He was definitely, uh, you know, on the list for a while, and uh, so no surprises at the club. But it's going to be very, very challenging. Even though he's got the backup of Jeremy Camp, he's coming with Said Bakati, who had the same experience at Pegs Wall and Feyenoord, bad experiences. And there's two coaches, Johan Dame, a French guy, who was entry manager last season. Uh, we stand the staff and Eva van Dinteren. I think it could be a chance for Yamstam to revive. His career as a manager, but uh, it's, it's going to be very challenging. Cincinnati uh, has been struggling, even though they strengthen the squad of the summer in March and uh, in January and February, but it's going to be difficult. Yeah, we've heard Stam's comments about how he thinks the MLS compares with other leagues. Now, you commentated a, a lot for ESPN Africa. How do you see the MLS compared to the other big leagues that we're used to in Europe? Well, uh, look, I've been covering the MLS for the last, you know, eight or nine years. I can see a massive improvement. And especially if you look at the, the, the type of player they're bringing for the last, you know, two or three years. And initially it was like uh, retired players from Europe, like Steven Gerrard, David Beckham. But now you can see younger players coming from uh, uh, European clubs, but also from South America. I've, you know, I had a meeting a few years ago, I think a couple of years ago with the uh, MLS guys in London, in IMG, they had a clear uh, idea of they want the MLS to evolve. They want to become a, a platform for young players to try those players to uh, bigger bigger leagues and they want to improve uh, the style of football. There's a strong will to improve the league and I've seen it you know, for the last few years definitely and, and there's more and more South American players coming through. They're going to the right direction financially. They have uh, the power to do it and, uh, and they're well structured. They have proper stadiums. And I can definitely see like football has taken off in the States and North America as well, because Canada is part of the MLS as well. Yeah, I mean, we heard from Jeff Birding, who's the president of FC Cincinnati, they're building a new stadium, which is a capacity of 26,000, which I guess fits in quite well. That's pretty decent. I, I mean, Toronto have been playing in the BMO field, which is about the same size on the edge of the city. There, there's a huge fan base, you know, in Cincinnati, but not only in Cincinnati, if you look like, um, at AFC, I mean, it's a great stadium and great atmosphere. Uh, Los Angeles Galaxy is pretty good, you know, if you're a fan to go to a game. Vancouver, but also more, more an impact. Huge fan base. Historical clubs, you know, in, in the MLS and people obviously not knowing the league. And if you don't watch it, you, you know, it's difficult to have an idea. But they're all big clubs in the States and in Canada and it's coming the right direction. I think, you know, for me to go forward, they have to be part of the uh, ideally the Copa Libertadores because uh, they're doing Champions League in the CONCACAF. The only challenging time is when they play the uh, Mexican uh, clubs. However, the MLS, again, they have an idea to create a new uh, competitions to involve all the clubs in North America, Central America and the South America. That would be a great competition, but are you going to fit it with all those federations? It's going to be very challenging, but I think it could be, it could be you know, a magnificent competition, like having Cincinnati or LAFC playing against uh, Boca Junior. It could be very interesting. There are a lot of South American managers also go into the MLS, and we had Gerardo Martino who previously managed Barcelona, go into Atlanta United and winning the title and they played some good football. I haven't seen much, but Stefan probably would have a few more words to say about it. And then we had Guillermo Barros Esquilotto go into MLS after winning things with Boca Juniors. And it's interesting that in Argentina, uh, they didn't really expect that sort of competition, let's say, because they are used to losing their young players to European clubs, which became normal for them. And now they're losing their young players to MLS. At, at first, it was something pretty weird for them, but then they realized, okay, they can get good money for those players from uh, clubs in the US. So the competition that Stefan mentioned, potential competition, is also interesting, but 
the logistics are not there. Because even now in Copa Libertadores, when you have to travel, let's say, I don't know, from Uruguay to Bolivia, it can take a lot of time. You cannot just travel by a chartered flight sometimes. You know, you have to have, take stopovers in different countries. And imagine traveling from Montevideo, let's say, to play in New York, and then getting back and playing the local league games and all that stuff. The, the idea in itself, it's quite good because you could get Mexican clubs who are really strong because they're not playing Libertadores. They used to play Libertadores in Tigres. And she was, I think, played in the final of Libertadores, which was a good uh, thing for the competition when they had Mexican clubs. But now they're not playing there. And from the commercial point of view, yeah, it's an interesting idea, but it's really difficult to make it happen. So at the moment, yeah, <laughs> Argentina has to suffer losing its talents to MLS alongside the European clubs and leagues. What we've seen for the last as well, you know, maybe three or four years, they're starting to have academies and to develop, you know, the uh, youth project. And this, especially, you know, Dallas has been, you know, really uh, pushing for that and uh, having proper structure in place. And Dallas, you know, head coach now, was in charge of the, uh, the academy, uh, the, the, the club, and they took over the, uh, the first team anyway la last year, uh, Luchi Gonzalez. And his assistant coach is Peter Lucin, a French guy who used to play for Marseille and PAG. They all come from the academy uh, in Dallas. This season, the last season, they used a lot of youth from the academy into the first team. And some of them you may know because they play the World Cup, Pomical, Savania. They are great, promising players. And a lot of foreign clubs, especially in Europe, are following closely those, uh, those players. Now, it's also interesting to say about the development of the players last year. In the Under-20 World Cup, France lost to the United States in the round of 16. It was a very open, interesting game. And U.S. won it 3-2. And France had a lot of good players, like Diaby, who was marvelous at Bayer Leverkusen against Werder Bremen in the Bundesliga game, played for France, and there were some other good players there. But still, the French team lost to the U.S. Uh, a friend of mine, you know, Stefan Addo, went to LA Galaxy. Uh, that was a uh, few years ago. Nearly signed for LA Galaxy as a coach to develop the academy. Uh, the director of the academy it didn't happen. Uh, for various reasons. Even though you're telling me there's still a long way to go, there's a lot of potential in the States with the young players, but they need to have the right coaching structure in place. So what happened, uh, they signed an agreement with the French Federation and they do some exchanges between coaches and to look at what's working in France in the academies and try to transfer that in the States, but not using everything from the French academy. But this, the Spanish has been signed with the French Federation and the, uh, and the MLS. Watch this space. More leagues are coming back out of the coronavirus situation. So what have you been watching this week, Dimitra? Yeah, Estonia returned. And if you wanted me to describe it in one word, I would go for modest. Something like that. From, from Costa Rica, it was Guadalupe Limon on Tuesday. And then three games from Estonia. And Kaylee game where our friend Osmar Ibanez scored a winning goal for Seoul FC. Well done, Osmar. Yes, the winning goal and a 2-1 away win for FC Seoul at Pohang Steelers. Came with 15 minutes to go. Scored from a corner. He's off the mark for the season. And that means that FC Seoul are now joint top of the table, along with Ulsan Hyundai, John Buck and Sanju Sangmu, who all have six points. The Estonian Premium Liga was suspended in early March after just one round of games. Every game is live on YouTube, and the game of the week is live in Estonia on ETV2. Hosted from the touchline this week by Ayat Suvari for the comeback game. Unfortunately, it turned out to be a nil-nil draw between champions Flora Tallinn and Tami Katartu. That happens a bit. Ayat's with us now. Did it feel unusual with the extra precautions needed to broadcast? I was thinking as I was going to the stadium that it's going to feel really unusual that it's like we're back after two months and all of these new regulations and rules that we have to follow uh, it's going to be really different but once I got there it wasn't really that different once the game had actually started or or you know to be more accurate once the broadcast had started and I had started uh, my work and uh, you know sitting in the studio before the match uh, just getting into the match and and introducing the the teams and everything and it didn't really feel that different it felt like you know football is back and and yeah we have um, some new things that we need to do and clean the surfaces and wear the masks before the broadcast starts but other than that it was you know football's back so that didn't feel very unusual, the fact that everything has to be wiped down and everything has to be just so. 
I think it's just the new reality. I think we just have to get used to that. And, you know, it's a small price to pay for, you know, to be able to watch football again uh, live and, and enjoy the excitement of it. I mean, I know some of the stadiums in Estonia are are reasonably small, but this was in the national stadium. It's the Alakok Arena. It's where the European Super Cup was on a few years ago, the Madrid Derby. So you've got pretty much the biggest stadium in the country. You've got football back, but the stadium's empty. That must feel kind of unusual. It was unusual, although, to be fair, it is a big stadium for Estonia. It's rarely full especially when we're talking about league games it's it's not full it's not even close to being full usually during the league games but because it's built kind of like as a circle it's it's very contained so all the sounds and the noises really sort of reverberate back and 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 sound really loud so even if there's only 1000 people watching it feels like a proper crowd so yes uh, that felt strange and a little bit sad of course but you know once the game got going if if you didn't pay much attention to that it wasn't really that strange but it was interesting though that you could hear so clearly what the players were saying to each other what the coaches were saying even as uh, some of the substitutes were doing the warm ups you could hear what they were talking about and there was even a quite an interesting little storm in a teacup when one of the younger players threatened to break the other the opponent's uh, knees and make sure that he never plays football again and it got picked up here by the press and and was kind of like spun into this great story how oh wow what we just heard well it turned out to be nothing really very serious but it was just so like it's something we would have missed otherwise well, at least they didn't threaten to cough on him. Um, and in terms <laughs> in terms of the biggest games there like the crowds you get would be a few thousand um few thousands probably pushing it a bit too far. Maybe the biggest crowds would be about 1,500 for the derby games between Levadia and Flora or Flora and Kalu. These are the most popular ones. But yes, the audience is growing steadily every year. So it might have been 2,000 this year. So we will never know now. Well, that's true. Is this going to be the situation for the season now? It will be... Empty stadiums for the rest of the season? Is that the season no, that made? not quite. Uh, with this, uh, we are allowed to let in the public from the 1st of July, but only uh, 1,000 people, that's the, that's the maximum. And maybe after that, I don't know, we'll see how things go. But for the time being, from 1st of July onwards, it's maximum 1,000 people allowed. I mean, and I see a lot of the most recent Estonian national squad a lot still play in Estonia, which is still quite healthy, I guess, for the domestic game. Yes, it is. Yes. People are very happy, you know, for the chance and opportunity to go and get to see them play week after week. But obviously, at the same time, for the um, competitiveness of our national team, we would prefer for the some of the players to go abroad and get a chance to play there as well. So it's kind of a double-edged sword really so um, sometimes you kind of want to see them here and sometimes you want to see them play in a higher level. And in terms of the coronavirus epidemic in Estonia like your level of deaths has been quite low compared to other countries in Europe. How has this been achieved? I'm not sure I'm the best uh, person to give answer to that, but I do think uh, we reacted very early on. I think it was only the numbers uh, who had been diagnosed were still in there. I don't know, maybe about 10 people had been diagnosed when we already had the... um, the lockdown in place and quarantines and everything. And Estonians uh, do normally even, like we are quite, we're not extremely social people, to be honest. So social distancing isn't that strange to us. And as opposed to Southern Europeans, we don't usually hug and kiss when we say hello. We keep a distance always. Uh, We don't gather very much. It's also the climate here. It's like too cold to gather all all the time and, you know, be together. So I think it's the... um, sort of our natural social distancing combined with the measures put in place from quite early on. And people are also quite diligent in doing what the government says. Like, we're not very rebellious, I suppose. If the government says, stay at home, 
then Estonians just grunt and bear it, basically. <laughs> yeah, and but wasn't one of the early cases as well on one of the remote islands because of a volleyball match? It was, yes. There was a well, a European Cup game. It was uh, originally supposed to be played one leg in Italy in Milan and one leg in that island. It's a small island called Sarama. Because of the situation in northern Italy, they decided to play both of the legs in, in Sarama. Obviously, not a good decision. But back then, in very early days of March, I guess people didn't really have the scope yet how serious this problem is, how serious is this illness. And it was allowed. Uh, so the game was played and, and it did cause um, a very, very serious situation in the island of Sarama. And thankfully now, by now, it's it's over there as well. So that island has been opened up as well and uh, things are getting better. But yes, the, it would have been much better for Estonia overall had that game not happened, but it did happen. In your league, well, from what I've seen this week, for example, there are a lot of young foreign players, Example examples like players from Africa, I saw a guy who joined uh, Baida and he played for Mali in the Under-20 World Cup last year. So is there any sort of, let's say, network of agents bringing all those young players to Estonia? So that would be their first European experience. So they then can go on and probably make money for the clubs and, of course, for, for the agents. Yes, I think so. Yes, there are a couple of agents who work with uh, agents in Africa or agents in Europe who have contacts in Africa. And Baida has been one of the success stories they have brought in African players before. Like last year, they brought in a very good player called Alassane Ayata, and he has now moved on. I think he only spent uh, half a season here. He was really, really good. And then he moved on to... Uh, not sure. I think it was Sweden, perhaps Norway. And I think because of those success stories that we've had, a couple of really good players have come. Uh, that has encouraged the agents and uh, and the clubs to trust that network, I suppose. Also, another thing that I've noticed, we, the wind in the first few games was just ferocious. So, so I, I just remembered how Marcello Lippi was visiting Scotland, I think, and he said... I just don't really understand how you can teach kids anything with this <laughs> wind. So I, I was just wondering also, when a kid, for example, wants to play football in Estonia, how does it start uh, for him? Do, do, do his parents pay any fees for the club or is it just free for a kid to come in and start playing football and uh, what kind of coaching he could get at this early age? It's quite often that the coaches from youth clubs go to uh, nursery schools and kindergartens to not specifically football training, but just to kind of like once a week, they get together, the children, and they say, you know, we'll play. And they play with a softball. And it's not like really a proper football training or anything, but it's more like a game. And that kind of introduces children to football and makes them like it, I suppose, and also helps parents to decide whether that's what uh, they want their children to do once they're six or seven years old and are sort of like going to school and, and picking their first trainings or, um, on, you, know, you know, what they want to do. And also it gives coaches a chance to maybe already start weeding out the kids who show any kind of potential or at least interest so that's one thing that they do but yeah usually it's parents uh, just bring their kids to clubs all of the clubs here have their own youth systems uh, not exactly academies but sort of youth leagues and youth clubs and they all have uh, youth trainers youth coaches and it's not free you have to pay a monthly fee, but it's not very expensive. And usually the municipal system gives you some kind of subsidy towards it. Or like if you have three children, you only have to pay for one to go and, and the others can join free or sometimes it's something like that. So 
it's not expensive and you basically you have to pay something for any kind of uh, extracurricular activities that your kids want to do be it sports or art or or whatever and when it comes to sports then i think uh, football is probably one of the cheapest ones because you know you don't have to pay any kind of extra equipment i can't imagine what it would be like for equestrian sports for example or rally driving which is a uh, massively popular here you mentioned that the biggest crowd you might get at the league game is a thousand and a half. So I'm just wondering, uh, former players like Mart Palm or Konstantin Vasiliev, when they just walk around Tallinn, do they recognize? Yes. They recognize that? <laughs> People say, oh, yeah, that's the greatest player we've ever had. They are definitely recognized, but they can also walk around. Like I said, Estonians are sort of like not very social like they stare a lot but they don't really go and talk sometimes they might say, oh can i take a picture with you but it's not like it's nothing like you can't compare it to britain or ireland it's it's nothing like that i have lived in scotland for a couple of years so yeah i mean the it's just so different the way superstars are seen here and they're seen you know in britain and ireland it's it's massively different and here people are just kind of like reserved i suppose so they can walk around but they are very popular and very loved here as well i think in scotland if you would meet uh, anyone playing for the national team now people wouldn't give, even bother talking to them <laughs> with how successful the team is. <laughs> yes i spoke to some of the colleagues back home and there were some ukrainian players uh, and managers also uh, worked in estonia do you know if there is any influence from the so-called black markets on betting patterns and all that in the local league games? Because they had some rumors, let's say, in some of the games. Yes, we've definitely had it in the past. Maybe five years ago, maybe a bit, maybe even a bit less, there was talks about so-called Lithuanian mafia. Kind of like there are guys in Lithuania who phone their counterparts like the peers here and they talk to them and they want to get them involved in stuff like that. And of course, there have been games uh, over the past 10 years, let's say, I think about five or six games where the manipulation has been uh, caught. But our FA has worked very hard on getting the illegal betting and all that kind of thing under control. And obviously there are the UEFA systems, the, the raiders that uh, keep an eye on the whole betting system. And I think they work very closely with that. So uh, in the last couple of years, the problem, at least to my knowledge, has been much, much smaller. Maybe I don't even think that there has been any kind of rumors about specific games being manipulated within the past two or three years but before that there were problems and I and I know sometime in the recent past maybe in the past five years when eight guys were even prosecuted taken to court some of them were exonerated and some of them were I don't know maybe they had some kind of a deal they made a deal I can't remember the specifics but yes they are working to eradicate it but it's obviously kind of like a disease it's hard to root out yeah. and i'm not saying that this is just like you know lithuanians evil lithuanians who come here <laughs> i'm sh i'm sure there are estonians doing it too it's just a matter of getting caught by virtue of the fact that i think there's only about four or five leagues currently operating in europe have you noticed that there's a greater popularity overseas in the estonian premier league Yes, as I'm interviewed by <laughs> by an Irish uh, podcast at the moment, then definitely yes. But also, uh, there has been interest in, uh, I don't know specifically what countries, but some countries have been interested in buying the, the rights to show uh, our league. And also, I've noticed that the journalists have reported on what's happening and probably were watching uh, the broadcast on Wednesday and the, the other ones on Tuesday as well, although I don't know specific numbers yet, how, how high the numbers went up. But uh, I think there has been interest, which is good for us, but I'm just hoping that uh, we can offer <laughs> all these uh, football-hungry Europeans at least some kind of a respite while this is going on. 
Yeah, uh, Poland's back next week as well, so maybe a little bit of extra competition. And all the games are on YouTube as well, not just the games that your channel covers, but all the matches are available internationally now as well. Yes, they are, yes. And uh, all of them can be watched. And even uh, women's Premier League games from uh, June onwards, one game per round. Because obviously the popularity of women's football has risen. You showed the uh, Women's World Cup as well last summer. What was the reaction like? To that very positive overwhelmingly positive i was quite surprised and the viewing numbers were very good and uh, we didn't show the whole thing on tv but we did have all the games on uh, online yeah uh, i think people are getting more and more into the idea that women can play in a in a high level as well and, and the competitiveness the um the strength behind it it's uh, it's all good so uh, there's hope and I have to ask you about the men's national team as well, because there was only one point gained from the qualifying campaign for Euro 2020. And I mean, you look at some of the players, you've got right now Clavan at Cagliari, who had a bit of time in England, Henrik Oyama, Awudzu Wudge, Henry Anie, who's in the Netherlands, Eric Sorg, who's in the United States. So what was it that sort of went wrong over the past couple of years? We've had some changes, like some of the older players have sort of retired now some of the younger players have come up it doesn't all gel that well i'm not entirely sure what the reason is but after our success with the, in 2011 when uh, when we play, famously played ireland and lost uh, i think things started to go a bit downhill because maybe in the beginning we were sort of laying on the laurels a bit and thinking like, oh, we can do this now, but it actually requires work and development all the time. Like I said, some of the players retired. Some of our best players had problems like uh, Ragnar Klavan was injured quite often. Uh, he had the club commitments, which took quite a toll on him. And he wasn't always available to play. Konstantin Vasiliev had problems in Poland. Uh, so he didn't get like a regular playing time there. And then I think just like tiny things, it was kind of like a butterfly effect. One thing happened, then another thing, things kind of unraveled. Then we had a new coach, uh, a completely new coach from Sweden, who perhaps didn't know all the players and the, the local, because our players had gotten so used to playing under this Estonian coach, Darmo Rudli, and then this new coach came and just things didn't work out. And one thing started unraveling and then another thing, and it was kind of like, before we knew it, it had all deteriorated to a point where it was kind of like hard to to get back up again and then obviously had quite a hard group as well with with Netherlands and uh, Germany and and yeah Estonians were bitterly disappointed in in that group uh, and in the results but hopefully things will go back up again because that's that's what happens in football it's like you have these ups and downs and once you're down the only way back is up I suppose. Mm. And I mean, as you say, even though the league gets maybe 1,500, 2,000 at the games, I mean, I've been at a couple of Estonia home games and like your stadium is full. So it has it has a really good following. It has. Yes. Yeah. The uh, national team is popular and uh, and loved and people are behind it, even when we're not doing that well, which is a good sign. We had quite high hopes about this year now, hoping with a Nations League and because there you get to play like teams that are on your level and you get to win, which is a big boost for your, you know, the, the whole mental side. Because it's, I, I can imagine it can be so disheartening to lose 0-8. It's just one of these things that can just sort of like draw the joy out of it. But yeah, before the coronavirus hit, we had such high hopes for this year for uh, the Baltic tournament and for the Nations League. But now, I don't know what's going to happen if we even get to play this year. Ayat Suvari of ETV in Estonia. Thank you. And no football in France at the moment, of course, as the season has been brought to an early halt. We're going to do a special edition on French football next time around with League on World Feed commentator Matt Spiro. He does the official League on podcast Le Beau Jeu, and there's a book coming out soon in the renaissance of French football. Sacre Bleu from Zidane to Mbappe, a football journey. Uh, the shutdown in France, Matt, how's that being viewed overall? Um, hi, well, it's been viewed sort of... Yeah, a little bit like in other countries, I think, insofar as 
people don't think the instructions have been that clear. The government's coming for a lot of criticism. There have been lies about the fact that nobody needed to wear masks and actually they didn't have masks in France initially and that was why they were saying that. So yeah, there's been the usual sort of um, discussion and, and, and controversy. It's been stricter actually here, certainly than in the UK where my family are, where um, you know you can basically go out without being checked all the time because here in france we've had to fill out um, an authorization form every time we want to go out even you know to to walk the dog or to go and to go and buy some bread or something but um yeah look we've got through it in some respects because the lockdown's been eased 10 days ago and um my kids have sort of started going back to school only sort of one or two days a week but uh yeah it's been it's, it's been a very strange period and we also know that the football was stopped very quickly. So we haven't had so much the debate, when is the league going to start again? Because as soon as um, the Prime Minister said there's going to be no sport until September, the French League had an emergency meeting and they said, well, listen, we're, we're, we're stopping the season now. Uh, we're going to give the title to PSG. We're going to work everything out on a points per game basis. And uh, yeah, two teams have been relegated. There's been a lot of arguing, but there's been no yeah, debate about when the league is going to start because it is not going to restart. And was there general unhappiness or acceptance that that was it, the league's called, we're done? I think initially, uh, of course, and it, there was you know, anger, particularly from the two teams that were relegated. Um, but I think initially, generally, people accepted it. And then the longer we've gone on and the more um, people have been hearing about other leagues, and you know, obviously the Bundesliga starting, and uh, we've had different clubs taking legal action a- against the league, and we've had Leon. Um, and their president, Jean-Michel Oulas, who is very outspoken and also very powerful in the French game, taking legal action and um, still sort of campaigning for the league to restart, you know, saying it's not too late. We can, you know, change, change our minds. So I think in more recent days, people have thought, well, hang on, maybe it was a bit hasty. Maybe we should have waited a couple of weeks, looked into all the different possibilities. But yeah, I mean, the main thing, to be honest, Will, in France, I think it's similar in a lot of countries, you know, the, the finances are driving these decisions. Then in France, I've got a new TV deal starting in August with, with Media Pro who've come in and uh, the new French domestic deal is going to be absolutely huge. It's more than a billion euros. First time it's gone that high. And I think the French League decided they needed to be, or they needed just to make sure there was no way Media Pro could back out of this deal. If, you know, if, for example, they said, we're going to try and play, finish this season and we might have to push next season back to January, you know, that might be giving them a chance to say, well, hang on, we're not going to give you this money. And then French football would have been, you know, in enormous trouble. It's already in big trouble. But yeah, if, if that TV deal fell through, it would be the end for a lot of clubs on it. By the way, how much of a surprise was it that Media Pro came in to, to launch a new channel? Because they are known as a global distributor and not, you know, an outlet to watch very surprising um it was surprising that the deal was that lucrative like i said over over a billion i think the last deal was just under 700 million so it's a massive increase at a time when league um, you know i wouldn't say it wouldn't warrant a massive increase but there's not been a lot of suspense you know in terms of psg just walking the the league title of the last couple of years so it was a big surprise um and the fact that media pro um yeah, came in, not even a French company, um, and 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 have put this money in. There, there, there was surprise. There were also reports about how Media Pro had been talking to Syria and that Syria had done their due diligence and decided that they didn't want to go with Media Pro because they, they weren't convinced about the financial guarantee. So there was concern in France, particularly because Media Pro have taken quite a lot of time. They've been leaving it quite late to sort of set up their channel. So people have still been thinking, well, hang on, are they, you know, they're not going to sort of walk out on us at the last minute, are they? But they are finally sort of getting things set up now. Sort of the timing is quite bad for a number of elements. Um, is it a good time to bring a book out? Obviously, it, it was taking a long time to write and to, you know, go through the various drafts and so on. And then this happens. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know is, is, is the answer I would you know the fact that bookstores are, are closed at the moment, as far as I'm as far as I'm aware, in the UK. I, I don't know if that's the case in Ireland. Um, would suggest it's not a great time to to bring a book book out. Um, the book industry has obviously taken a, a big hit. I think it is slowly starting to sort of to wake up a bit again. You know, there are, the flip side is that people 
certainly during the lockdown, have a lot of time on their hands and probably are keen to read about things other than COVID. Um, and also newspapers, podcasts and radio stations are keen for other things to talk about. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopefully getting a bit of publicity for it. The reason that we brought it out and I sort of busted a gut over Christmas to try and finish this book was to try and bring it out before the Euros. So when the Euros were, were postponed, yeah, I, I, I was certainly thinking, do we put this back? Um, there may be an updated version to come out before the, before the Euros actually do take place, if they take place next year. But um, look, I don't know. Yeah, ask me that question again in a few months. <laughs> And we'll have an hour-long French football special coming up in our next edition with Matt Spiro. Sacre Bleu from Zidane to Mbappe, a football journey. That's his new book. It's coming out at the end of the month. We now try to have a commentator on every week to talk about their commentary heroes. And this week, a man synonymous with Spanish football coverage. Here are the commentary heroes of Rob Palmer of Sky Sports. Um, it's an interesting one. I was given my break by John Motson when 19, 1988, Seoul Olympics, when I was playing for a team called Bridlington Town. Uh, and uh, John Motson came as the reporter to cover the game in the FA Cup when they covered the team for the very first round of the FA Cup all the way to the final. I was in goal for Brit. I'd been a media student. I was looking to get into the media. Um, I, I caught him at the bar. He remembered that. And then come the Seoul Olympics, John Motson couldn't do the interview. Um, Brian Barwick rang up and said, who are the interesting players in your team for a feature? Motty said, why don't I do it? And I, that, get, that gave him my TV break. So I owe my kind of career, if you like, to John Motson. So Motty would be one. Whether I would actually uh, base my style on John Motson is arguable. Um, when I hear Alan Parry occasionally is on the TV, and I wonder whether that was my game. So maybe someone delivery, and the fact that I moved to Merseyside 30 years ago, I, maybe the delivery and the, the chirpiness of Alan Parry. And I also followed uh, Clive Tilsley into Granada Television, and Clive gave me some great tips when I succeeded him at Granada TV. And I think he's a fantastic wordsmith as well. And I've got to mention Rob Holford, who's my best pal. We go back to when we were interviewed on each other's CVs back in uh, 1986. And he, he is my best pal in the world. So an amalgamation of all of those. Yeah, I remember you in Granada. I mean, it was a good period. Manchester United were on the way up. Um, Liverpool had a couple of seasons and then were on the way down by that stage, I guess. Yeah, we were. At, uh, I was at Granada TV in the early 90s. My boss, a guy called Paul Doherty, his dad was the great Peter Doherty, the, the Island International. He was my mentor and Clive Tilsley's mentor before that. And we had a wonderful in at Manchester United. We were doing all kinds of behind-the-scenes documentaries, waiting for them to win the Premier League title. I think we finally got it at the third attempt um, of, of filming for a whole season. So we used to go in there and do all the Manchester United in-house videos before Man U TV as well. They had a, an association with Granada TV. And I think it was a monthly video. So you go interview Sir Alex Ferguson at 7.30 in the morning over a cup of tea and breakfast as well. So it was a, a wonderful apprenticeship. And we also did the same for Liverpool Football Club. So I was there as well as part of the kind of the Spice Boys generation with Fowler and McManaman and those people as well. So uh, those were great times. Different times to these days where you've got to go through agents, solicitors, lawyers, press people and media mentors or whatever just to say hello to a footballer. What was Fergie like over breakfast? I have to ask. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to say frightening, but because you were kind of there in, a, in an official capacity and you had been briefed on maybe what you wanted to talk about, it wasn't as fearsome as meeting him after they'd... Uh... Do you know what? It wasn't too bad when they'd drawn a game, uh, when, they, when they'd lost a game. When they won a game, obviously, it was OK. Um, when they lost the game, it was pretty magnanimous because when he drew a game, he, he was horrible. But generally, if we did those interviews there, he'd be sitting there. Sometimes you'd have to go tell him he's got a bit of egg dripping off his off his, uh, off his his chin or, you know, he, he was slurping his tea into the microphone and things like that. And he, that, that was the, the most difficult bit, really. But he had great body language as well. You could tell if he didn't like you asking a question that he would cough. And if you liked the question, you, would, you can see me now. He'd sit back, put his hands behind his head roll back in the chair, look up to the skies and regale you with a great story as well. So uh, it, it was a good education. He, he treated the reporters like he treated the players. You never quite knew where you were with him. Yeah, and the thing with Granada is that there was a long line of different commentators as well. Like there was yourself, Clive, like Martin Tyler, Gerald Sinstat. It seemed to have been a great place. Nelton Wellsby was presenting and he became ITV's network presenter. It just seemed to be a great academy of, of broadcasting talent, if you like. Yeah, um, Paul, Paul Doherty was the great man there. He's the only man I think I've ever seen Sir Alex Ferguson genuinely scared of. There are stories that, I can't tell you them here, but Paul kept Sir, Sir Alex in a job. He persuaded the Edwards family to keep Fergie in a job back in the Mark Robbins year. It was that 1990 when they won, 
onto the FA Cup. So he, he again, Paul was, Malcolm Allison would just pop in for a drink occasionally. John Bond would pop in for a drink. Fergie, if he was in town, would come in and have a cup of coffee with him as well. So the people that were in there broadcasting-wise at my time were me, I was the, re, I was the commentator, Rob McCaffrey, who went to Sky Television. He was the reporter. Elton was the presenter. He was an ITV's network presenter. Ali Mann were, was a reporter and, and also a commentator as well. And before that, when we were researching games, you would have Martin Tyler, who started off as a researcher and became a commentator. Gerald Sinstaff. I've got a feeling as well, Barry Davis had a very short spell there as well. I might be wrong, but I think back in the very early days as well. Um, and then there were odd people as well, like Paul Greengrass, who was the great kind of TV, uh, film producer who was also a research and I think worked on World in Action at Grand Island Television. So it was a, an eclectic mix of people you were following through those doors. No, you know what? You're right. Barry Davis was at Granada, I think, in the 60s before he joined BBC and he did a World Cup for ITV. And didn't you as well? Did you do an early 90s World Cup? Uh, oh, God, you have got very good knowledge, haven't you? Scary, that. Yeah. No, it's didn't, I, <laughs> didn't you do the one of the goals of the tournament? It was your commentary, wasn't it? Oh, I ran, I think his name was. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I remember. Oh, I ran and how he ran. Yeah, that, that was... Um, I, I was edu- I went over to... I played football and I went to America to go uh, to a uh, university on a scholarship over there. So I, I had this big thing about wanting to go back and, and kind of complete the circle as well. So I was coaching in Minnesota uh, in the summer of 94. And I wrote to Trevor East, who was head of ITV, I think then saying, look, if you're short of anybody to make the tea, make the coffee do the airport runs, whatever. I'd just like to be involved in the World Cup. And I got a call out the blue one day um, from Trevor. I was in the field, I think, in, in Wisconsin, coaching football close to Minnesota. And he said, would you like to come? They said, uh, Peter Brackley's doing the, all the non-ITV games. There are too many for him to do. Would you come and take a couple uh, off Peter to take the weight off his shoulders? And I said, yeah. And he said, fine, right. We booked you a flight tomorrow morning. We knew you say yes. Um, and you're flying into Dallas and you've got a game at, I think, six o'clock the next night. I, I'm, I'm not as exacting, but I think it was a, a Nigeria game. And he said, you're doing that. It went well for me. So whichever game was being shown on the BBC, I would commentate on ITV. And obviously they would use the highlights and then they would use it in the packages. So I worked all the way up to the semifinals when unexpectedly my son was born three weeks early uh, and I had to co- come back. July the 10th, he's telling me. I know your birthday. Yeah, 15 weeks early. 15 weeks early. He was born 15 weeks early and it was July, July the 10th that I had to come back. So, yeah, um, ITV were great to me. So I did what, one championship for them. And then obviously Sky came along and that's it. That's been the story of your life successfully. <laughs> yes, as, as you quite rightly said in the middle, I've been a servant to Sky and other broadcasters <laughs> since I was in 95, 96, I think I went there, but I worked on Euro 96 for the World Broadcasters as well. And that was like kind of the first year that I joined Sky. So I've been there ever since. Well, that's it for this week. Back early next week with more. Please remember to rate and subscribe no matter what your service is. You can leave comments on our Twitter page, Lockdown Football, and shows are now going up on YouTube also. So until next time, from Mark Rodden, Stefan Shawnee, Dimitra Zulai, and me, Will Downing, it's goodbye. (laughs) 